Okay, in part two of our presentation on ecological thinking and creativity, we're going to look at systems thinking uh, and emergence. Uh, systems thinking is, uh, in some senses, a relatively new way of uh, approaching the world in, in the sciences and the social sciences that looks at um, the entirety the, of, of things in terms of the big picture and their relationships rather than focusing down on one part of, of something. Uh, it's inspired by, by the discipline of ecology, ecology with its uh, emphasis on cycles and systems and interdependence, but the ideas and systems thinking are finding a much broader application in, in many, many things, everything from you know, economics and human behavior uh, all the way to you know, science and, in, in our case, creative thinking. So to begin this, we're going to look at the concept of, of just the word ecology, for instance. You know, what does ecology mean? Well, the true meaning of the world, uh, sorry, the true meaning of the word, um, eco uh, means oikos, uh, comes from the, the Greek oikos, which means home. So a literal translation would be study of the home, our abode, our environment, our habitat, our place uh, as to where we are. And psychology, I'm sorry, ecology is an attempt to understand the nature of the complex systems and organisms that constitute such a home, such a place, such a habitat. And so the field of ecology is really sort of bequeathed to the rest of the sciences um, a very, very useful tool in approaching how about how we go about understanding and thinking about many of the things we find um, in our world. So one good way of kind of you know pulling apart the idea of well, what what does study of home mean is to understand the difference between home and a house. Um, typically, a house is literally just a physical structure. Um, it, it's a you know, a piece of material designed to house something. A home carries a completely different connotation. If you want to take a few minutes and stop the video and think about that, um, feel free. So home refers to something very different than just the physical structure. Home focuses more on relationships, not just the things. Um, what we find in homes are you know, people we care about, places we care about, things we care about. And these are things we have relationships to. Uh, so rather than just a collection of objects and materials and roofs and walls, a home would have, you know, be in, in, imbued with this completely different kind of uh, world of feelings and emotions that are basically established by our relationships uh, to things. And so one of the biggest revolutions in modern thinking, at least, is taking this whole idea of ecology and what ecology um, studies and how it approaches things and applying it to a great many other areas of human endeavor. So one way to start is to um, think about how do we traditionally go about trying to understand something. So in the sciences, for example, if you wanted to know, you know, what is a rabbit? How do you understand a rabbit? Well, the traditional approach to understanding a rabbit is to begin by taking that rabbit out of its environment, to remove the rabbit, capture it, shoot it, kill it. Um, we isolate the rabbit, okay? Then the next thing we do is we, we break the rabbit down. We begin to um, look inside the rabbit. And what do we find when we look inside the rabbit is a, is a unique kind of physiology and biology. Um, we want to know what the rabbit's made of, what makes it ticks. What makes a tick? And this is a little bit hard to take. I'll switch to this. There we go. Um, so the Easter Bunny. So to understand something, we want to know what it's made of, what's inside it. So what we're doing now is we're initiating a process of breaking things down to their smallest pieces uh, with the intention that if we understand the smallest pieces, then we will understand the whole. So we break the rabbit down. We look at its organs, its unique um, biology. Uh, we look at its cells, um, all the structures that go into making the rabbit, and we break all the cells down to DNA. Um, and so what we're doing is we're actually engaging a process where we're analyzing something. And analysis means to take apart, to break down. And this whole approach um, is really the, the 
the hallmark of the last 400 years of science has been based on the reductive approach. How do we understand something and the best way to do that? And the answer to that is to find out what it's made out of. And when you find out what it's made of, the next step is to find out what that's made out of. And when you get there and so on and so forth. So you're constantly breaking down into smaller pieces, hence the term reductive approach. Now this has been an incredibly useful um, approach. We've learned an awful lot. Uh, most of our current advances in technology and science have been based on, on this way of thinking about things. But what's been happening in the last couple of decades is researchers and scientists have been thinking that, well, there's other ways to understand things. And that if we really want a full understanding of something, like a rabbit, for example, we need to embrace a much broader, bigger picture of what it means uh, to be a rabbit. So this approach is referred to as the ecological approach. And what the ecological approach does is it doesn't isolate the rabbit from its world. It looks at the rabbit in its world. It looks at the rabbit in terms of its environment. What is its physical environment, its habitat? You know, where does it live? How does it relate to the resources around it? Uh, what does it eat? What does it drink? Um, what parts of the physical world um, contribute to the rabbit being a rabbit? And in turn, what does the rabbit give back to the environment and what it's a source of food, for instance, for many, many sorts of animals. And so really to understand what a rabbit is, we can break it down, we can make it into little pieces, but that gives us only half of the picture. The other half is what is the rabbit in terms of its relation, its kind of interconnectedness to its environment, which is a very complex um, interrelationship with a great many elements, food, to water, to predators, etc. And this whole thing came about through adopting um, ideas that were, you know, home in that were at home in ecology. So like the nutrient cycle, for example, something you might find in an ecology class uh, where, you know, the, the nutrients in the soil become part of the plants and the plants become food for small animals and small animals become food for larger animals and then animals and plants all decompose and they break down it goes back into the soil. Um, so the food, the nutrient, the energy just keeps cycling around. And so this picture, which is very common in an ecology class, uh, became the model for trying to understand uh, things from a more ecological approach. Um, and so a lot of the ideas in ecology were just borrowed by other disciplines. Uh, and within that, they were seeing cycles within cycles, you know, that it wasn't just a matter of one sort of set of relationships, that these relationships, these systems were embedded into larger systems, which were embedded into larger systems. And so what developed was a very complicated uh, way of thinking about things. Uh, and like I said, these ideas were taken beyond the field of, of um, biology and the natural sciences. And they were, you know, used and analyzed within the contexts of, you know, social sciences, psychology, um, all sorts of things. So, for example, even learning and education. So pedagogy, for instance, which is the theory of and the practice of teaching, uh, its traditional approach would have focused on this. You know, what is uh, teaching and learning about? Well, it's about the information. It's, well, at least this was the idea. And that the quality of the learning and the teaching was based on the quality of the information. So the idea was to transfer the information from the textbook or the teacher into the student's head. Now, a more ecological approach to this um, steps back from that, looks at it in a bigger picture and it says, well, there's a lot more going on than just that piece of information that's transferring because um, how does it transfer? What's the nature of the transfer? How do you encourage the transfer? And is it really just a transfer? So modern theories of pedagogy have begun to look at, um, you know, learning in, in a very, very different picture. And one way to think about that is um, to think of, you know, learning as situated, you know, it's in a context, it happens in a particular place, in a particular way with particular people. So 
it's very complicated, I'm not going to get into it, but we can just look at one aspect of it, which is demonstrated in these two pictures. You know, just look at the physical structure of learning. Where do you learn? What is the space that you are in when you learn? Are you sitting in rows, formica tables, and beige walls, and fluorescent lights, uh, as opposed to something like this? where you have a very different kind of uh, sensory environment. What is the relationship between sensory environment uh, to learning and things like that? So the new way of thinking about you know, the science of learning, the science of teaching, takes a much broader ecological big picture approach uh, to the situation. So in other words, it's much more than just the content. You know, To teach something and what you're teaching is not the same as learning. Learning, you know, you can have a a great plan for teaching, but does that mean that students are learning it? Not at all. So the two things are very different, and what we've come to understand is um, learning is a whole different animal. And so to understand how people learn, we have to look at things in a much broader context. And so this is an example of taking that sort of uh, ecological approach and applying it to something like education. Um, so what's come out of this is a whole movement in the sciences and the social sciences and psychology and all of that, uh, towards thinking about things in these terms, their networks, their relationships, their interdependence, their connections, the process, rather than the actual isolated elements themselves, that this really constitutes how things work in the world. Um, and that if we really want to understand something, and this is Fritjof Kapra, one of the leaders in this uh, systems movement, we really have to understand the larger whole, that breaking something down into pieces uh, is one way of going about it. But understanding that piece again in, in the bigger picture is the other end. Now this is kind of a new uh, development in, in thinking lately. Uh, so, you know, this is what, you know, domains and researchers and people are, are really sort of grappling with, but it's really not something new. It's been around for a very, very long time. We've just forgotten about it for a very long time. Uh, systems thinking was pioneered and developed and perfected by indigenous peoples. Uh, their understanding of humanity, their humanity, their culture was deeply embedded in their understanding of the natural world and the cycles and the processes of all of this. So it's not a new way of thinking about the world. It's been around as long as pretty much humans have been on the planet. It's just something that Western science, to pick one example, has just largely ignored for the last uh, several hundred years. And so what we want to do is, is think about how does this interact with um, creativity and the things that we're looking at. So to do that, we need to just kind of unpack a little bit more about it. And so seeing the big picture, which is the hallmark of ecological thinking, uh, it has given birth to many, many different sorts of approaches and ways of uh, dealing with the world. These are some of the concepts and theories. They're not the same by any means, but they all share something in common, and that is the idea that things are much more messy and complex and unpredictable and interconnected than we ever thought that they were. Uh, so to give you a few examples, uh, if you're, because, you know, my background is in art, I use lots of art and visual examples, but if you're learning how to draw, for instance, what you're actually learning to do is see relationships. Um, every art teacher uh, will tell you, if, if, if you're trying to draw things realistically, is not to focus on, on the details and the things themselves, but focus much more on how they relate to other things. Are they darker? Are they lighter? Are they taller? Are they shorter? Are they brighter? Are they duller? Things like that. So everything is about relationship. Um, and to really understand what you're looking at, you really have to shift your focus from the object to the relationships within the image. And there's a, you know, a really good example in the world of color. Um, from a reductive approach, we would break color down into wavelengths and different colored uh, vibrations of electromagnetic energy, and that these are the wavelengths that our eye detects. But it's really not the case. Wavelength is part of the picture, but really when we see color, what we're actually seeing is the brain making sense of the big picture. So here's a, here's a good example. If you look at this image, 
you might see a bunch of red strawberries. Um, but you also might be surprised to know that there's no red in this picture. There's absolutely no red pixels on your screen right now. Those strawberries are actually gray, but your brain is making you see red because the brain knows what's in the picture. Um, not by memory, but just by pure calculation. So for example, something you'll notice about this picture is that it's behind a blue-green filter, what we call cyan. So there's a cyan filter between you and the strawberries. What your eyes are seeing is gray. Let me show you what that gray is. So here's Photoshop. I've taken a piece of that strawberry out, and that's what the actual color is in Photoshop. And if I expand that image, you see, as it moves over here, it blends into it. So I'm not lying to you, it's gray. But your eye is picking up the gray. It knows it's seeing gray, but your brain says, well, if I'm seeing something that's gray and I'm seeing it through a blue-green filter, the only way something can appear gray through a blue-green filter is if it's red. Because the filter filters out the red. So gray is a neutral color, it doesn't have any color. Um, if it was a gray object through a blue-green filter, it would look like a blue-green gray, but it doesn't. It has no color. The only way it can have no color is if what's behind the filter, in other words, the other side of the image, has to be red. So your brain makes this inference. It looks at this image, it detects gray, it detects a blue-green filter, and it says, well, they must be red objects. So what you see is red. Now, it's kind of a roundabout explanation, but it really sums up what's happening here. There's no red, but we see red because that's what's in the world. And we see that because our brain is taking in the entire image. It's not looking at things in isolation. And color is not something we see in isolation. Um, everything that we understand and perceive and know about exists in relationship. And this is something that's been ignored for a very long time. And so this gives rise to the third and final part of this discussion, which is the idea of emergence. So this context, this environment where things come together, where things connect, often creates new things by virtue of its complexity. You take a bunch of things that in themselves are quite simple, you put them all together, and what you get is something very complex, very complicated. So this is um, a bunch of starlings, a bunch of birds flying. But if you watch this, and there's lots of YouTube videos of it, it acts like a giant blob, almost with a mind of its own, going in one direction, then another, then up, then down, then shooting to the left, shooting to the... But there's no leader. There's no boss. There's no head starling saying, go this way, go that way. So all these birds put together start to move as if they are one giant creature. Um, and we see this phenomena, this, this quality of emergence, in quite a few things. Um, and so when we step back and see the big picture, what we find is something different than the sum of its parts. It's not just a bunch of birds together. Uh, it's not just a bunch of people acting together. What happens is something emerges out of that. Uh, another level of intelligence or agency whatever whatever it might be. So, here, so one way of describing that is we say 1 plus 1 equals 3. So you put things together, they're very simple, and what comes out of it is something more than the sum of its parts, something that goes beyond that. We see examples in that in termite mounds, for instance. Termites are very simple creatures. Um, any one termite is not equipped to design and build a termite mound with all the sort of features we described in part one, and yet it happens. Cities, nobody's really in charge of the city in terms of its everyday movements uh, and interactions. The, the, the mayor might technically be in charge of the city, but they really don't control everything. But the cities manage to work. Stock markets has a mind of its own. It moves to the left, it moves to the right, it goes up, it goes down. Um, but there's really you know, no entity called the stock market. It's just a whole aggregate of people making decisions to buy and sell. Same with weather patterns. And so we find these phenomena of emergence everywhere. And here, here's a very simple example. Um, so here's a bunch of Lego blocks. 
Uh, the Lego piece itself is quite simple. It's one color. And so we have nine little pieces of Lego, maybe less, maybe the two of them are joined together, I'm not sure. Um, and by themselves, they're quite simple. But when you start putting them together, they start to make more complex patterns. When you go even more complex, all of a sudden, we begin to get, you, know, you probably noticed, there's a picture here of the Mona Lisa. There she is. So from a purely visual standpoint, here are elements that are very, very simple, just one color. You put them together, enough of them in a complex way, in a particular arrangement, and all of a sudden, you begin to get uh, an image of a, a woman looking back at you. And even if you think about this, all this is is pixels on your screen. And yet when you look at this person, you get the feeling that she is thinking, that she's looking at you. Well, she's not exactly looking at you. She's looking over your right shoulder. But there's something going on in her head. How can that be? She's just pixels on the screen or she's just paint on the canvas. Uh, and the same thing happens... Uh, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So here's another example. This is the Mona Lisa by an artist called Deborah Sperber. Uh, that I saw in uh, North Carolina. A fascinating image. Here's a lens on a pole, and it's taking this image and flipping it upside down. But this image is just made of spools of thread. Each one of these is just a simple color. But put them together, and you get a person looking at you, which is you know, quite extraordinary. Uh, music is like that. You look at this piece of music, and all it is is a bunch of dots on, a, on paper with some lines, but it's a composer or mu a musician. Um, they can hear this. They can look at this and they can hear it, and musicians will then perform this, and you and I can start feeling emotions, uh, complex emotions, from just simple sounds put together in complicated ways. And so this idea of emergence, of something coming out, of something that's quite simple, uh, is an idea that's very exciting and people are beginning to look more and more into it and, and seeing its applicability across many, many domains. Um, even consciousness is considered by some researchers to be an emergent property. There's just a bunch of electrons and electricity and chemical signals going on in the brain. All of a sudden you appear or I appear and we have thoughts and we have feelings that are complicated and uh, idiosyncratic and all of that. Or that maybe Consciousness emerges out of society through all the thoughts and ideas and feelings and languages that people create, uh, giving them a sense of uh, who we are and, and agency. And so to bring this back, um, I'm sorry, I think this might be cutting off a little bit. Creativity is also being seen more recently as an emergent cult, uh, property and culture. And sorry, I think it's been, yeah, it is cut off. And so what constitutes creativity? Why do things happen? Well, if you put enough people together, uh, creative people with ideas, you're going to start to have things happening. And so in, as, when you look at creativity as an emergent process, then you see that when you get a complex system of people with feelings, with ideas, with thoughts, with experiences, and you put everybody together, you're going to get unpredictable, new, surprising, and creative developments. Um, and this one way of thinking about this is to you know, change the language. And one person who's done a very good job of that is Brian Eno, a musician and artist. And he developed the idea of genius rather than genius. And I'll just give you a few moments, uh, pause the video and, and just read this yourself. I won't read it to you. Okay, so what uh, Eno is talking about is this kind of ecology where people come together and, and things just happen, that almost like it's in the air. Another way of speaking about this is talk about the zeitgeist, a uh, German word which talks about the spirit of the time, um, the influences, what's happening in, in the atmosphere, the cultural atmosphere, so to speak. And we find this a lot in the field of science. So we've talked about this before in the course, um, the idea of multiple discovery, that somehow ideas creative breakthroughs and inventions seem to almost be in the air. Uh, Newton and Leibniz both came up with calculus independently at more or less the same time. And the same thing happened with um, Darwin and Wallace, their theory of evolution through natural selection. 
Um, and Einstein and Poincaré, uh, French scientists, both came up with energy mass equivalency and the special theory of relativity at roughly the same time. And so we find in the field of creativity studies that you know you get this kind of thing happening where you know it's almost like what's being discovered is part of the community it's part of the the dialogue and the interaction of, of these minds even if they don't know each other even if they're far apart from each other uh, so you know that's one of the elements that comes up in creativity um, and so if we look at creative thinking like we have in the course, we, we've seen that the socio-cultural aspect of creativity really has come to define a proper understanding of, of how creativity works. And, um, and so with the systems thinking, we add another layer to that, a layer which you know, begins to look at relationships and connections and patterns that you know, people bring to the table in terms of creating a complex dynamic complex interaction and tapestry of ideas, which is why things just come out of the blue. They're just, or apparently come out of the blue. They just seem really, really fascinating and interesting and almost unpredictable. And only in hindsight do we realize that they weren't. And so to wrap it up, you know, ecological thinking really, uh, as, as an approach in the last several decades, has provided a real shift in perspective, mm -hmm. a shift from things to relationships, from content to process, from structure to patterns. It's all about this dynamic interaction of things. And for many, this is the key understanding of you know, how we should be approaching the world. You know, that if we're gonna work with the problems of the world, we need to think in the way the world thinks. We need to think ecologically. And so to wrap it up, um, the kind of new age desire to become one with the universe is really not something we need to aspire to simply because we already are one with everything we're connected um, fortunately so we're already there and unfortunately because what we do how we act um, our influence has a ripple effect um, we're not isolated we're not separate um, as much as it might appear that way uh, we're intimately connected and who we are is a product of our context, our environment. And so hopefully, you know, this makes a lot of sense to you uh, as a way of sort of bringing together the sustainable aspects of the course and the creative thinking parts of the course and just showing, you know, here's an area where they overlap and intersect and sort of support each other.